You are good and your mercy is forever. Can we join in the word? I think we should. I want to talk to us today about what I call dealing with faulty foundations. Dealing with faulty foundations. Get used to that. That's how the service will be. I'll talk to you tonight about dealing with faulty foundations. We are going to address issues around foundations, ancestry, covenants. And then next week, I will talk to you again about dealing with witchcraft and household wickedness. All right? So make sure you are around next week. There are things that will be uprooted. There are people here under the sound of my voice, respectfully speaking, I want to acknowledge and appreciate your coming into the house of God today. But you came because God wants your eyes to be open to certain impediments. Certain obstacles that the enemy has placed along your path and in your family that you are not aware of. And by the end of this service, your eyes will be open to see that these invisible traps or invisible snares are what, are what is responsible for what you've been going through. And tonight you'll be set free. In the name of Jesus Christ. Dealing with faulty foundations. Isaiah chapter 51 from verse 1 to 2. Isaiah 51 from verse 1 to 2. He said, listen to me, you who follow after righteousness. You who seek the Lord. Look to the rock from which you were hewn. The word hewn is the same as the word to dig or to carve out. And to the hole of the pit from which you were dug. Look to Abraham your father and to Sarah who bore you. For I called him alone and blessed him and increased him. God was addressing his people, the children of Israel. God was about to say things that would determine their future from this point. And it's interesting to know that God will have them look into their past, into their roots, into the foundations of their existence. Of course, we know that Abraham is the patriarch and the father of the nation Israel. And so God was about to do something in the nation of Israel now, something that will positively affect their future. That is what you will see from verse 3 down. But in order for the stage to be set for what God wants to do, God said, look to where you came out from. And I've said this before and I will keep repeating it because I believe this is the truth. With all due respect. That if you follow through the storyline of scripture, God has never introduced any man in his generation, his generation, without first exhuming the foundation of that man. The word exhume means to dig out. It means to probe. It means to search deep. There is never a time that God introduced a man or a woman to their generation without first of all examining their foundations. So most of the times when you read in scripture, this is how the Bible will put it. It will say, so-so person, the son of so-so, and so, the son of so-so, and so. Is that true? In fact, even the Lord Jesus did not escape that. Of course, when he came on earth, he came as a man. And so he was subjected to everything that man was subjected to. If man would hunger, Jesus also experienced hunger. If man would be tired, Jesus experienced tiredness. He relinquished his godly attributes in heaven before coming down in flesh. 
So he had to depend on the Holy Spirit for everything. That is why nothing concerning ministry started for him until the Spirit of God had come upon him. That was to show us that Jesus was man as well. So when you look at Luke chapter 3, when he was baptized by John the Baptist, and he came out of the water, the Spirit of God descended on him, and that became the commissioning for his ministry. You will discover, please ensure you are not distracted. Amen? It's not just about sitting still. Make sure your mind and your attention is here. So, after that baptismal service, if you start reading from verse 23, 24 down to the end of that chapter, you'll discover that the writer began to trace the genealogy of Jesus. Every time you're about to step forth in life into destiny, the realm of the spirit begins to check your foundation. There are forces in the realm of the spirit that will begin to probe your root. And the reason is because foundations are very important as far as the future of any structure is concerned. In a moment or two, if you allow me, I would like to give you clear definitions of the word foundations. Lay some premises and then we will go deep into the word but let's look at some other scriptures verse 16 of the same isaiah 51 verse 16 of the same isaiah 51 and i have put my words in your mouth actually a few years ago this was a word that the lord gave me at a time of retreat this was a word god spoke to me and it activated certain things in my life and in my ministry. And I've put my words in your mouth. I have covered you with the shadow of my hand. That I may plant the heavens. And do what? Lay the foundation. Somebody say foundations. Of the earth. Notice that he didn't say anything about foundations when he was talking about heaven. But he spoke about foundations when he was talking about the earth. And when he's talking about the earth, he's also talking about the inhabitants on the surface of the earth. So this is a prophetic commissioning that God was giving to his servant. That I've given you authority to examine and to set right the foundation of my people and anyone to whom I will send you to on earth. Do you understand that? He said, and to say to Zion, you are my people. And anytime God gives you, if you are like me, if you've had the experience where maybe in the time of prayer or seeking the face of God, God shows you a scripture. He speaks a scripture to you. That scripture becomes your signature scripture. Something in the realm of the spirit has been conferred over you. And you will need to be conscious of it so you can walk in the full expression of it. Some of you, there are things that God has told you in scripture. I'm not talking about the one you found. No. I'm saying that you may have known the scripture before, but God showed you specifically in that season. I'd like you to know that the operations of the Spirit of God in your life henceforth from the day that encounter came is going to be tied heavily to that scripture. That scripture is a key to the storehouses of heaven for certain resources to be deployed to you. But if you are not conscious of it, you will walk through life. It's like somebody having millions in his account and not knowing that he has money. Maybe because he didn't get a credit a lot. Is that true? And this night, some of you that God has spoken some personal word to, we are going to, by the power of the Holy Ghost, activate it man, its manifestation. Amen. Your amen needs life. Amen. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Psalms 51 verse 5. We are still talking on dealing with foundations. Psalms 51 verse 5. This is David speaking. As a king, he said, Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin my mother conceived me. David was exclaiming. At this point, he was repenting before God because of, you know, a crime, a sin he committed. And if you know the story of David from the beginning of his life to this point, you will never realize or you will never believe that he could do such a thing. Kill the man got his wife pregnant and when the man was dead got married to the, the man 
That is because there were things in the foundation of David's life that were hidden. There are things in your life that may not manifest until you are in certain seasons of glory or you are at certain stages of prime in your life. So if you don't understand dealings around foundations, you will discover that at a particular time in your life, you will be faced with certain events that you don't understand and you don't know from whence they came from. How many of you have been there before? Certain things begin to happen that are strange. You've never seen this kind of catastrophe before. And you begin to wonder where they came from. How many of you have been there before? Let me know if I'm talking to myself. A certain point in your life when all is going well, you wake up one morning and you just lose everything in your account. And there's no explanation as to how the money went. Or you wake up one day and everybody in your house is sick. Mysteriously. Or you enter a season in your life where you think things should just be good as usual. And instantly you begin to record a, a nexus of failures. I don't know if you have experienced that before. Today we are going to diagnose what that problem is. It is nothing more than foundations. David said in sin, my mother conceived me. I was born in iniquity. I was born in sin. As a result, even though I was later anointed, it didn't deal with what was in my foundation in sin. Now, let me explain something to you that is not in scripture. Many scholars of the Bible believe, as it is recorded in scriptural history, that David was the son of another woman. He was not the same mother, the same father with all his seven brothers. You remember when Samuel came to Jesse to anoint the king? Seven of Jesse's sons passed before him. And God didn't accept any of them. Those seven sons were the children of the first wife, the original wife. So possibly many Bible scholars have agreed that David was the son of a concubine. I don't have time, I would have shown you David's relationship with men like Abishai and Joab. How that they were cousins and all of that. If you hear that, then you would believe what he's saying in this scripture. That he's seen my mother because that's illegitimate birth is that true Romans chapter 5 verse 12 he said therefore just as through one man sin entered the world and death through sin and thus death spread to all men because all sin this, this scripture is like mathematics through one man sin entered the world and because of sin death came and because of that, all men were declared sinners. Not because they committed any sin, but because all men came from one man and it was through that man that sin. Let's go to defining foundations. Foundations. If you are writing, I'll try to be as fast as I can because I want us to live here in good time. Number one, these are the definitions I can give you on the word foundations. Number one, origins, beginnings, or on the line basis. Foundations are defined as origins, beginnings, on the line basis. Or principles. Of a theme or structure. Origins, beginnings, underlying basis or principles of a theme or structure. Another word for principle is rudiments. In other words, the elementary, uh, the elementary part of that thing. The things that come together to form that particular thing or structure. Number two. Foundations are the forces that determine the existence or the future of a structure. Foundations are the forces that determine the existence or the future of a structure or system. 
the forces that determine the existence or the future of a structure or system. Having said that, let's look at foundations from the standpoint of human relations and family. Human relations and family context of foundations. Can I go on? They are forces that determines the existence or quality of life. Forces that determines the existence or quality of life in the individuals within a sociological context. Forces that determines the existence or quality of life in the individuals that are within a sociological context individuals in a family in a community the forces that determines the existence and the quality of life the kind of life that they will live the kind of results that they will produce the things about their life will be determined by these forces now to zoom in on our topic let me define what i call evil foundations evil or faulty foundations evil or faulty foundations are negative forces they are negative forces at the beginnings negative forces at the beginnings or origins of families negative forces at the beginning or origins of families that occasion negative or evil events at the origin of that family these are the underlying forces that occasion negative of course if there are negative forces they will only give birth to negative events that occasion negative or evil events in the perpetual existence of that family evil foundations are negative forces at the beginnings or origins of families that occasion negative or evil events in the perpetual existence of that family what i'm sharing tonight is no respecter of tribe or race or skin color or social status or even anointing say amen very true it is important that you note that evil foundations are a product of curses and satanic covenants they are the product of curses or satanic covenants so let's try to understand what these two words are curses and covenants being that they are responsible for the delivery of foundations evil foundations that occasion negative and evil events in the lives of individuals and families curses curses are negative decrees for those of us that are writing curses are negative decrees verdicts or pronouncements Causes are negative decrees, verdicts, or pronouncements that limit, disempower, or destroy the lives and destinies of its recipients. Am I too fast for you? Verdicts or pronouncements that limit, disempower, or destroy the lives and destinies of its recipients. What are causes? Negative decrees, verdicts. In other words, statements that were made, pronouncements that limit, disempower, or destroy the lives and destinies of its recipient. It is also important that you note that these curses can come either unwittingly. In other words, someone may just make a pronouncement, not really because he means it. And you see, that's been the problem with many people.
people are careless sometimes respectfully speaking with their speech especially as it affects the people around them or the people who are close to them not knowing that these statements that are made carry great implications so curses can come unwittingly somebody just made a pronouncement he didn't mean it maybe he said it out of anger and later on he cooled down not realizing what the damage he had just done or they can be deliberately and it usually will happen by someone who is in a, a form of authority over the individual that is affected that means to place a course you must have some form of authority over the individual the family or the thing that you are crossing so jesus you remember when he crossed the fig tree the bible said what happened that the fig tree withered to its root the reason was because number one jesus was man as at that time and god had given man dominion over everything he created number two jesus was the word that created even that tree that means that somebody who is a father figure a mother figure a spiritual authority if you occupy any form of authority over the individual or the family your pronouncement can contribute to the progress or to the destruction of that individual covenants covenants are pacts p-a-c-t-s pacts or agreements or transactions pacts agreements or transactions between a mortal and a spirit entity or between a mortal and a mortal in other words between two human beings but majorly because of our teaching tonight between a human being and a spirit covenants are pacts agreements or transactions between a mortal and a spirit entity when covenants are made they are they are made for the following reasons first of all they are made to occasion an advantage on the life of the individual that is the human being now is seeking some form of advantage that is based on the strength of that spirit entity so when a human being is making a covenant with a spirit whether knowingly or knowingly one of the reasons will be to occasion an advantage in his or her life that is based on the strength of that spirit entity of course we believe that the realm of the spirit is superior to this realm in fact this material realm is a product of the realm of the spirit you can see that in genesis 2 verse 4 that means that the energy level that drives this material realm is sourced from the realm of the spirit that is why power for instance electrical energy can you see it can you see it with your eyes but can you deny its reality good so these are spiritual forces that are able to energize or to determine the cause of things in the natural in fact those of you who read science in school they spoke about an atom the atom is the smallest indivisible part of an element and that atom is made up of three forces a proton a neutron and an electron that cycles around it these are things you cannot see with your eyes but they determine the framework and the existence of that particular element whatever it is so one of the reasons for why covenants are made with spirits is to occasion an advantage now generations ago our forefathers in you know they were devoid of civilization and in their primitive age you know those times they called the stone age isn't it when technology was either at its cradle or was not even here at all africa for example was one of the race that was the most disadvantaged because we were not awakened to civilization as it were 
And because of that, there were many problems that our ancestors encountered. For instance, malaria was an affliction. But because they had no exposure to science and technology had not advanced, malaria became a big deal for them. And so anytime somebody was sick of malaria, the person will almost surely die. Because they don't even get to discover when that parasite that causes malaria enters the body of the individual. There were no hospitals. There were no ways they could do tests to know that a, paras a parasite was in the blood of that individual. So many of them died because of malaria. Now, if you have malaria, a shot of injection, chloroquine injection can do the job. Or you can take drugs for three days and that's all. But in their time, it was a deadly disease because of the level of ignorance then. And they were faced with these and many other problems. So in order to seek help, knowing that they were alone, to survive alone, they had to reach out to the supernatural. They had to reach out to the realm of the spirit. They knew that they were unseen forces that were existing around them. And so they went making transactions and dealings and agreements with this spirit seeking to occasion an advantage from this spirit we don't have drug to cure malaria so help us heal us from malaria in fact in those times if you were a medicine man that's what they call them in our days now is a medical doctor you go to school and be trained but in those days there were people who were specialized in studying the herbs in the bush that could heal any disease I'd like you to know that that was not natural knowledge. They had the assistance of spirit entities that probably they knew nothing about that assisted them to know which herb can cure which disease. So they were like mediums between the realm of the spirit and the natural world. And unknown to them, this was a covenant that they entered into. The second reason why covenants are made with spirit or the second thing that happens when covenants are made between mortals and spirit is that it has transgenerational implications. It has transgenerational implications. When a human being makes a deal with a spirit unknown to that human being, the spirit one's transgenerational allegiance just the way you have agreed with me to serve me and i will do this for you so in your descendants in every generation i must have somebody who will pledge their loyalty to me and through that person i will still enslave the entire descendant so that my signature will be seen on their lives and you the reason was because spirits don't have body they don't have bodies. For you to be on this earth, you need a body to manifest. So spirits were always looking for human beings or looking for human entities or uh, families through which they can manifest their characteristics. You know, a spirit doesn't die. A spirit doesn't feel pain. Many of the limitations we have as human beings, they don't have it. But one of the ways you can torment a spirit is that the spirit will continually exist from one generation to an, another generation without manifesting its realities on the earth. Spirits want to manifest their realities. And the realm of men is the showroom for spirits. That's why they don't mind thousands of them staying in the body of one man. Remember the man that Jesus met at Gadara? How many people, how many spirits were in him? It's a legion. A legion is a troop of 6,000 Roman soldiers. I don't even know if this compound can contain them. And all of them must take turns in manifesting in that man. That's why the Bible says this man, he was so full of energy. The Bible says he will cry morning till night. He will cut himself with stones. Anytime you see extraordinary discharge of energy in a human being or an animal, there's a spirit involved. 
And for making the mistake to allowing that spirit manifest, the spirit will seek to see that that manifestation of his continues from one generation after the other from that individual. Number three, what happens when covenants are made with spirit? It involves submission. On the part of the lesser party, it involves submission. The human will have to submit to that spirit entity. And on the part of the spirit, it will involve dominion or lordship. The spirit wants to be seen and worshipped and revered as Lord. That is why Satan came to Jesus in the last temptation. What did he say? All the glory of the earth are mine and the kingdoms thereof. I will give it to you if only you fall down and what? Also, you need to know this about covenants. That there are three kinds of covenants, basically. I haven't understood that covenants are agreements and pacts that are made with spirit entities. Number one, there is spoken covenant. In other words, a transaction carried out between a spirit and a human being by way of words. As a matter of fact, there's almost no transaction with any evil spirit or any spirit at all that is without words. Because in the realm of the spirit, words are not just communicators. Words are conveyors. Words are the transport systems in the realm of the spirit. Words are the systems for creation in the realm of the spirit. That is why the word spirit is a word. Is that not true? And everything that exists, whether invisible or, vis or visible, is a word. You know, in 1 John chapter 5, one of those verses, he said, there are three that bear witness in the heavens, the spirit. Then he said, there are three that bear witness on earth, the spirit, the water, and the blood. The spirit, the water, and the blood. I'm talking about spoken covenants, isn't it? He said there are three that bear witness. And the Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 13 and in verse 1, that in, you will go back to this scripture, but go to 2 Corinthians 13 verse 1 and 2. It says in the mouth of two or three, 2 Corinthians 13 verse 1 or verse 2, it says in the mouth of two or three witness, a word is established. That means to witness is to speak and to agree, isn't it? Go back to 1 John. The spirit, the water, and the blood. Everybody look at me. If a man is making an agreement with a spirit, there are three entities involved there that are bearing witness to that covenant. First of all, the spirit. Then, the saliva coming from the mouth of that man is water. In as much as 70% of that man's body is water. And the blood that is in that man. And the Bible says the blood of flesh contains the life of flesh. There are three that bears witness on earth. The spirit, the water. Are you following me? So even if it was in the cover of darkness, like me or Kuku Sheshe. How many of you have watched that film? You had better watch that film. Go and grab it. Is online. Go and stream it and watch. You notice in the scene of that film where the lady appeared to him in his house. Who was with them? Nobody. Who, who heard everything that happened there? Who saw everything that happened? Nobody. But there were three witnesses there. The spirit that appeared and the water and the blood that is contained in that man. And in the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word is what? There is a written covenant. The Bible speaks of in Colossians chapter 2 verse 14. It speaks of the handwriting of ordinances that were written against us. Sometimes a contract, which is another form of a covenant, is written. And then you sign and another person sign. And there is a film those days they call Ghost Rider. The signature was with blood. How many of you have watched that film? You can go and watch those kind of films. He had a deal with the devil and they needed to sign the contract and he was to sign with his blood. But they didn't tell him he would sign with his blood. When he opened the contract, something caught his hand and blood spilled. And at the spilling of that blood, 1,500 demons were released to him to fulfill that contract. You see how spirits work. 
So some people can go to a shrine because even these days there are modern shrines now. Where you go and they will write, they will tell you to write something, they will fold it in paper and tell you to chew it. Or tell you to spit on it or whatever it is. Those are written covenants. They can even write something in the ground. As long as there was a transaction there between you and an entity and there was a writing, is a covenant. Then there is the most powerful of all, in my opinion, blood covenant. And I don't think I need to explain that to us. I don't know if these days young people still do blood covenants in relationship. If you did it this night, you need to humble yourself and seek deliverance. But I used to know those days that some people love themselves so much and maybe their parents don't want them to get married because you know, in Africa, marriage is between the families. When you say you love the lady so much, just hold out your love first. Oh. Go and visit them. Let them give you a list. Then your love will be tested by fire. Especially when one page of that list is two million. Say amen. amen. The way you are pretending, I, I don't understand. Amen. For those who are listening from outside Nigeria, well, these are African, African traditions we are discussing. Blood covenant. That is why you are coming into Christ Jesus. Your deliverance from the power of darkness into the kingdom of God happened by blood. Because the life of flesh is in this blood. And every time blood is spilled by any way whatsoever, there is a court in the realm of the spirit that ensures that the due diligence of justice is given for that blood. Even when that blood is, when a young lady sleeps with someone who is not a husband and is this virgin, blood was spilled. Is that not so? Covenant was enacted. And you know one thing with the realm of the spirit, their laws and their rules apply, whether you know it or not. In law, they used to say that ignorance of law is what? It's no excuse. Is that true? But tonight, every written, spoken of blood covenant that was entered into against you, with or without your knowledge, by the blood of Jesus, we delete it this night. I say we cancel it this night. Alright. Now let me give you examples of people who experience foundational troubles in scripture. I told you that foundations are the forces are the origin of a, of a family or an individual that determines the quality of life. So if those forces are divine forces, it means that the people in that family will experience breakthrough, progress, and advancement. But if those forces are satanic forces, then all you will find there is evil. That's why the devil is called the devil. Devil. Doer of evil. That's what the D is there for. Can we join in? You cannot fulfill destiny without first dealing with your foundations. I've said that before. And another thing that you need to know about foundations or foundational problems is that they can manifest in three forms. They either manifest as patterns, as cycles, or as mindsets. If you want to understand the foundation of an individual, study his life or her life to find out these three things. If there are patterns, if there are cycles, if there are mindsets. Now, a pattern is a tailor-made sequence of events. In other words, you are not the first person it is happening with. Patterns are usually transgenerational mistakes I'm talking in, this, in the sense of evil now. There are usually transgenerational mistakes, transgenerational reproach, or transgenerational problems. So you will discover that in this family, this, the women cannot bear children, or even if they will, it will not be on time. 
Because if you check the preceding generations, you will find pockets of that manifestation. That is called a pattern. That's one of the ways foundational problems manifest. Another way is a cycle. In the case of a cycle, a cycle happens within a generation. It's not necessarily transgenerational. So you can find the same thing happening among different siblings in one family. For instance, you will find a family where people struggle before they get admission to higher institution. The first born spent seven years before getting to the university. The second born managed to get polytechnic, but when she was going for a university degree, she spent two years before going. The third born spent four years before getting the admission. Now the fourth one is writing jam and is not passing. That's a cycle. It is factored into a particular time of their lives that this thing will occur. I wish I had the time I would have mentioned many other things, but you can use the examples to probe into your life or the life of someone who is close to you and find the reality of what I'm talking about. Patterns, or sorry, foundational problems can also manifest as mindset. Two years ago, we did a teaching on generational curses versus generational mindset i love you to get that teaching i think it's online on all our social media uh, resource centers or you can meet the media department generational curses versus generational mindset uh, in that teaching we try to examine that certain predicaments that befall families or individuals it's not all that are curses because in the case of a curse, somebody deliberately or unwittingly made a pronouncement. But then there are other problems that came up not because there was a curse, but because it was a mindset that the devil tricked people in that family to enter into one generation after another. For instance, you find a family where the men are frivolous with money and lazy. They don't really do anything. Is the women that are the ones working with all due respect but if they get money they can spend it i don't know what they did with the money you will find that that happened with the person's grandfather the person's father worked as a civil servant in the state government for 35 years and retired and all he has is an uncompleted house not because there was no money but because there was a mindset of frivolity and luxurious spending. The person didn't save or the person didn't make investment. They kept waiting for salary. And now the young man has finished graduating from the university. He's looking for an NGO job where he can make quick and big money. Meanwhile, God showed him in the university in a dream. God showed him entering into entrepreneurship. But because it is a mindset that is prevalent amongst the males... He wants to go the same way like his father and his grandfather, waiting for a job. And now it is five years he has been waiting for a job and no job. Somebody needs to tell that young man that this is a mindset. If you are with me, say amen. Do you want me to continue or I should stop? Let me give you a few examples. I want us to pray quickly because there are things that will break this night. A few examples from scripture. So I've told you that you cannot fulfill destiny without first dealing with your foundations. Before you step out in life, probe your foundation. Before you make any attempt, make a search into your history he said look to your roots look to whence the pit whence you were dug from and begin to discover what kind of foundational forces are existing let me show you the story of a prophet who was experiencing foundational captivity what did i say a prophet a prophet is the one that's supposed to deliver people no be so Oh, but let me show you a prophet who was a victim of what he was sent to deliver people from. Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 5. Jeremiah was a mighty prophet of God in the history of the children of Israel. 
In fact, Daniel had to study his books and his writings to understand the time of captivity that was determined by God for the children of Israel. And it was those informations that Daniel used to enter into a season of intercession that brought the deliverance of an entire nation called Israel. So Jeremiah was a powerful prophet, a prophet that other prophets looked up to. But let me show you his life. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I sanctified you. I ordained you a prophet to where? To where? Go to verse 9 and verse 10. That's a mighty anointing. Some prophets are sent to a family. Some prophets are even sent to an individual. Jesus said that there were many widows in Israel. But to none of them was Elijah the prophet sent to save the widow. Some prophets are sent to individuals. And what a wonderful thing it is where you locate the prophetic voice of God over your life. That human representative of the voice of God that is able to speak you from where you are to the purposes of God as designed for, by God for you. Some are sent to families, some to communities, some to territories, some to regions, some to nations, and some to the nations. Then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth and the Lord said to me, Behold, I have put my words in your mouth. See, I have this day set you over the nations and over the kingdoms. Then he began to talk about foundational issues. He said to root out and to pull down, to destroy and to throw down, to build and to plant. So Jeremiah carried a mighty deliverance anointing attached to his prophetic ministry to be able to correct the foundations of nations. Yet go to Jeremiah chapter 15. We are going to read verse 18, then verse 15, then verse 4. King James translation. Verse 18, verse 15, and verse 4. Jeremiah 15. With such a mighty anointing. Look at the problem of the prophet. This is the prophet talking. He said, why is my pain perpetual? And my wound incurable? He was groaning in agony at a stage in his life. This is a prophet sent to nations. This is a prophet who is supposed to be a deliverer. You know, Dr. D.K. Lukoya wrote a book, When the Deliverer Needs Deliverance. And I believe in my spirit that I'm talking to at least one person here. Who knows that he or she carries the calling of God on her life? You have seen manifestations around you. But you cannot explain the mysterious trap around your destiny. So that you are suffering from the things that you are meant to deliver others from. So last week somebody came to you to pray for the person because the person has dreams where they are feeding the person. But you remember that you too a day before that person came, they were feeding you in the dream. You are not the first. And God brought you here this night so that an end can be brought to that ugly situation. Why is my pain perpetual and my wound incurable? which refuses to be healed. This is a prophet talking. A prophet is supposed to speak for God and bring solution in a time of captivity. Bring answers in a season of affliction. Yet the problems, the prophet say, my own problem refuses to be healed. He said, will you surely be to me like an unreliable stream? He began to question God. As waters that fail, go to verse 15. Oh Lord, you know, he's still lamenting. Remember me and visit me, like some of you have prayed. And take vengeance for me on my persecutors. In your enduring patience, do not take me away. Know that for your sake I have suffered rebuke. How does he put it in New King James? There's one word I'm looking for there. Yeah, rebuke. He said, I've suffered. He was crying to God in prayers. Why is my pain like this? God, won't you deliver me? I've suffered too much reproach. People are mocking me now. I'm the one that is supposed to deliver people. But I'm the one that needs help. Here I am, saying that I'm a man of God, anointed by the grace of God. But I have to beg people to survive. He said, will you not deliver me? Will you not revenge me? This is witchcraft, I know. But will you not arise on my behalf? Will you not end my suffering? That's the prayer of somebody here. God answered. Go to verse 4.
this is God answering him now. God say, I will hand them over to trouble, to all kingdoms of the earth. He said, your problem is because of Manasseh, the son of Hezekiah, king of Judah, for what he did in Jerusalem. Somebody that had died. God said, this pain you are going through, Jeremiah, and by extension, the captivity of the entire nation you are, you are, you are raised from, is because of somebody in the ancestry. Somebody. Manasseh was an evil king. If you read his story in the book of 2 Kings and in 2 Chronicles, Manasseh devoted himself to idol worship. The Bible says he caused his sons to pass through the fire. That was a kind of sacrifice that they did in the occult, in the occult realm in those days. That you will sacrifice your children to demons in the fire. And because of that, you will be elevated to higher levels of spiritual authority. Even man, man Manasseh had troubles with other kings. Instead of him to go to God, he went to other gods. God had to force him in captivity to acknowledge the God of heaven. And because of what he did, he brought disaster upon Judah and Israel. Yet, generations later suffered because of what he did. Just because you come to church every day and pray, just because you are serving in the house of God, sowing seeds and giving your all for the gospel, which is very good, and I encourage you to continue, does not mean that that alone is a yardstick for God to undo what are foundational issues. Most of the time, God wants to answer our prayers because we seem like God have abandoned us. But don't you imagine that with what you have heard now, God may be screaming from the realm of the spirit, but you may not be hearing because you are devoid of understanding. God may be saying that my son, my daughter, I've heard your prayers, but you need to deal with your foundations first. That's where the problem is coming from. But when we develop a routine of prayer in the body of Christ that is not sensitive enough to inquire from God and probe the origin of things, we will pray and keep seeing the opposite of our prayers. And at a point, you will be brought to a place of frustration and begin to think that God was a liar. Are you here? I told somebody one time, I said, if you are going through a lot and you have prayed and there is no solution, I said, there is one more prayer you need to pray. It's called the prayer of inquiry. There was three years famine in Israel when David was king. David that God made a covenant with. David that in his reign, Israel experienced peace. God said, David was the man after my heart. Yet for three years, there was famine. People were dying of hunger. And it was like God was silent. Maybe they went to the ark of God. They didn't hear anything from God. And David was troubled. The Bible says, in the third year, David inquired of the Lord. That was when God spoke to him and said, this famine is a destruction brought upon Israel because of what Saul did. Saul killed the Gibeonites. And Joshua had made a, a covenant with the Gibeonites many years ago, 450 years ago, that they will not kill any of the inhabitants of Gibeonites, of, of Gibeon. But Saul, in his rash zeal, without knowledge, went and slayed them. And he didn't know that their blood cried to the court that was in heaven. And judgment was released. And instead of the judgment to come when the evil perpetrator was alive, he had died. But here was an innocent king. David, in fact, David loved God. He was the one who started creating choirs. That when they go to the temple, it's not only prayer and sacrifice. They will sing songs of worship. What did God want that David did not do? In fact, David was the one who initiated the building of a house for God. God said you would have built, but there's blood in your hands. But let your son build. Yet he suffered because of the mistakes made from his ancestry, from his foundations. I'm not here to make you scared tonight. I'm here to open your eyes by the wisdom of the word of God. I'm here to answer a long-standing question in your life. What is it about your life that God cannot lift? This pain, are you supposed to go through it continually? Every year you keep, you keep you know, encouraging yourself. You know the way Nigerians say it, one day you go better. Every year you keep believing in hope that someday our story will change. 
But the more the years pass by, the more your life is going from bad to worse. And amongst those serving in the house of God, you are number one. Amongst those you have given and sacrificed, you have given everything. What is the problem? Foundations. And I started by showing you from the life of a prophet, so you know that being a man of God doesn't make you escape it. Even the one that is talking to you, I have foundations to deal with. And you know what? Because the foundation of a building determines the destiny and the future of that building. Again and again, as years progress, they will have to, engineers will have to keep ensuring they check that building to the foundation. If they notice any crack, the next thing they are doing is they are looking at the foundation. Where is it coming from? I heard the story from Dr. Paul Enenche, God's servant, that he read somewhere a research was done that there was a building after many years cracks were noticed at the 12th floor of the building but those cracks were traced to the foundation 12th floor foundation so 12 generations later can suffer for what was entrenched from the foundation and sometimes because we don't understand found the issue of foundational dealing with foundational problems it looks like god is not powerful it looks like god is not all powerful but you must understand that the realm of the spirit is a realm of legalities it's a judicial realm it's not a realm that is corrupt like our realm the bible says enoch walked with god and then god took him he gave birth to a son that was named methuselah because of enoch's walk with god because of the covenant see the covenant relationship he had with god God elongated the lifespan of Methuselah. So much that Methuselah lived the longest on earth. As a matter of fact, historically speaking in scripture, Methuselah died. It was immediately after the death of Methuselah that the flood came. In fact, scholars believe, as it has been calculated, that it was the day Methuselah died that the flood came. That means that the extension of the life of Methuselah was the physical token of the grace that God gave the generation of Noah to repent. And Methuselah was the grandfather of Noah. Methuselah gave birth to Lamech, but Lamech died before him. Methuselah enjoyed that lifespan, even though he didn't do anything. But he enjoyed it because a man walked with God and, and set a foundation for longevity and for divine purposes to be fulfilled. So that when Noah was born, the great grand, the grandson, the great grandson, God, the Bible says, Noah found grace in the eyes of God. Not because of what Noah did, but because of a covenant that God had with his great grandfather. Some of you, your financial predicament is tied to your foundation. Unknown to you, there are people, nobody in your lineage has broken through this level of financial acquisition that is the reason why every time you are trying to break into the realm of millions it's as if all the forces around you begin to fight you there are foundations forces in your foundations that regulate the financial destiny of men within your bloodline so yes in christ jesus you are a new creature in the spirit but in the flesh you are covenanted to that lineage and Satan takes advantage of biological law because God is a law, God of law and order. That is why when Satan argued his case against Job before God, what did God say? Go ahead. Not because God could not overrule on Satan. But you see, if God overrules every time, God will be interrupting the synchronism within which generation is supposed to play. That's why it's not every time God will not arise when you are in a problem. No. Everything is according to his divine plan before the worlds began. So he has written your life like a story. And now that you are in a little crisis, what you are not seeing is that next month, God is going to make you come out of the crisis. And you are crying to God to intervene. God can intervene and overrule. But he has already written it in his book and it is law. And the thing with God is that if he says something or he decrees something, everyone including God is bound to his word. 
The Bible says in Psalms 138, he honors his word more than his name. So for some of you, your finances, check your foundation. This deal that you are trying to click for many years and it's not clicking. Let me ask you a question. Who has ever made money to that level? You will go and discover nobody. If you've made that discovery, then you are up against to deal with some foundational issues. Because you are going to be with one that will break through and become the progenitor of a new era. But the thing is, we think foundation is if you don't fight it now, what you don't fight today, your children will suffer from tomorrow. Another history, Abraham. In Genesis 11 and in Genesis chapter 12, the Bible gave us a genealogy that led to Abraham. From the descendant of Shem. Noah blessed Shem, remember. And made him to have authority over his other siblings. But there was a man that was born. His name was Terah. Terah happens to be the father of Abraham. If you read Genesis 11, in that genealogy, you will see that men were given birth at the age of 30, 25, 35, 30, 30 something. But when it was Terah's turn, it was when he was 70 years old. Now he started giving birth to children. Actually, because the word Terah means delay. Hold on. So at 70, when a man should be retiring to die, that's when he's giving birth. And from that day, a foundation was entrenched. Abraham, Terah gave birth to three sons. Naho, Abraham, and Hera. The delay affected all of them. Naho and Abraham, their wives were barren. Hera, who managed to succeed and give birth to Lot, died before his father so the delay kept following them in fact it was by a divine intervention after the fullness of time that Abraham's wife Sarah conceived and bore Isaac in chapter 22 when God now made a covenant with Abraham at Mount Moriah you remember when God said in blessing I will bless thee after that covenant the Bible says a, a news came to Abraham that your brother Nahor's wife has also conceived. I'm just trying to show you, I'm taking you through scripture to show you these things and that they are real. And it looks like there was untimely death on Haran because he died before his father. Is that true? Well, that death also affected his son Lot. Lot was very rich because he followed Abraham. But when he separated from Abraham, Remember, Abraham now had... That was why God made a covenant with Abraham. It was to erect a new foundation for him. And Lot left Abraham. In fact, he left him as Abraham. He didn't leave him as Abraham. The Abraham he left was the flesh dimension of Abraham. When Lot went to the city of Sodom, remember what happened to him. He came out of that place a destitute. He lost his wife and he eventually lost his life. Can I give you more on foundations? There's another story, the story of Moses and Joshua, men of God in scripture. The Bible says that Moses was a man that was mighty in word and in deed. Moses was a deliverer that God raised to free the children of Israel from Egypt. In Exodus chapter 2, Moses' parents were from the tribe of Levi, a cursed tribe, according to Genesis 49. Remember, Jacob cursed them. He said, Simeon and Levi are brothers of destruction. In their anger, they hamstrung an ox. They did this and that, this and that. He said, cursed be their anger, and let them be divided and scattered in Israel. And that thing followed the generations. Here comes an innocent boy born, Moses. Grew up, left Egypt went to the land of Midian, came back and delivered the children of Israel. He didn't know that his foundations was going to fight him. When they got into the wilderness, anger made him miss the promised land. So Moses was so anointed that the Bible says in Deuteronomy 34, when he died, 
that there was no man that God ever spoke to before or after that time. Like the way he spoke to Moses. He said he spoke to him face to face as a man who speak to his friends. As anointed and graced as Moses was, he didn't fulfill destiny. What was destiny? Take these people out of Egypt and bring them into the promised land. Did he do it? No. But here is another man, Joshua, who was not anointed. As a matter of fact, the only thing that Joshua had that was spiritual was the spirit of wisdom. And that spirit of wisdom came on him when Moses laid hands on him. Joshua was so not anointed that God told Moses before he died, he said, lay hands on Joshua in the presence of the elders and the children of Israel. He said, and put some of your honor upon him so that the children of Israel will obey him. Joshua had no anointing. Of course, you know, every time Moses entered the temple, the tents to seek the face of God, Joshua was around. He would hang around. Hang around the presence of God. But he had no access to what was there. All he had was the sword in his hand. And if you don't believe Joshua was not anointed, that is the reason why when they were fighting against Amalek, if Moses' hands came down, Joshua and the soldiers began to lose. But though Joshua was not anointed, he had a solid foundation. In Leviticus chapter 13, the Bible says Joshua, or Numbers chapter 13 rather, Joshua was from was, was the son of Nun, who was from the tribe of Ephraim. And in Genesis chapter 47, if you read, when, when Jacob blessed the sons of Israel, Genesis 48 rather, if you read verse 16 to 20, Jacob blessed the sons of Israel and the tribe of Ephraim. Ephraim was the younger one, but Jacob made Ephraim the older by blessing. In Genesis 49, Jacob also blessed Joseph again, who was their father. So Joshua came from a blessed tribe. And because of that, even though he was not anointed, he was able to win all his battles. He spoke and the son stand still. Until today, the son has not stood still to any man. He fulfilled his destiny. The Bible says he died a good age. Can I tell you something? You may not be so anointed, but if you deal with your foundation... You will make progress and you may even succeed beyond one who is anointed. May, may you not arrive late. I'm prophesying to you by the power of the Holy Ghost. Any cycle initiated in your life by the kingdom of darkness that will bring, that will make for late arrival. We cancel it this night. We cancel it this night. I project I project myself by the Spirit of God into your foundations. Every altar of delay, every cycle of delay, we declare it comes to an end this night in the name of Jesus Christ. Sit down, we're about to pray. Isaac was the only one that broke that gene. So only Rebecca was his wife. When they came to Jacob, Jacob multiplied immorality. He married two sisters and their maid, two maids. And he cursed his first son. Why? Because his first son slept with one of the maids. He didn't end there. Judah continued with the immorality. Slept with his daughter-in-law. How can you be walking on the road and just see a woman covered her face? He said, let me go into you. What kind of immorality is that? It was not his fault. It's in the lineage. I've seen some young people who are wonderful. Some of them are even born again. Some of them are even anointed. Skillful in life. Intelligent. Professional at what they do. But you find a propensity of immorality around them. It looks like they can't stay without doing something around that area. So the young man gets into an office. And after two years, he has slept with three people in that office. And he's not getting married to any of them. Don't blame him. Check his foundation. Maybe he didn't find out that his grandfather married four wives. And I tell people that if you think marriage is an excuse not to commit fornication or adultery, you may be lying, you know. If you think marriage will save you from immorality, that's why the one that happens in marriage, they call it adultery. Adult three. Huh? Not children's crop, adult tree. And because of that thing that Judah did, 
the tribe of Judah, though they were blessed, their inheritance kept escaping them. Very little was said about that tribe for many years. In fact, in Deuteronomy, one of the laws God gave the children of Israel, he said that no outsider, no stranger, or anyone born out of incest will stand in the congregation of, of my people. That was why when it was time for a king, instead of God to go to Judah, it was written that the scepter shall not depart from Judah. Where did God go to? Benjamin. You know why? There was something in the foundation that kept blocking or give, blocking the access for their original inheritance to find expression. That was why when it was time to anoint David, it had to be with a sacrifice. When it was Saul's turn, he poured oil, somewhere poured oil on him. But when it was David, God said, carry a cow and go and offer sacrifice first. Because this lineage that you are entering into, there is a foundation fighting from 10 generations before. And of course, you know David's story. His involvement with women till Uriah's wife killed a man and married a woman. And you know, he did it so neatly. When the Belen never showed, he made her his wife. He wrote a letter. He said, put the man that carries this letter at the hottest part of the battle and pull out. It was a very neat arrangement. And then he went and invoked foundations. Then what happened? Amnon, his first son, slept with his daughter, Tamar. It will interest you to know that Tamar was actually a namesake to Ju the woman that Judah slept with, Tamar, his son, his daughter-in-law. Who gave that lady that name? That's why I look at young couples these days, pray before your wife gives birth. Or pray before you give birth to get a name. These days where we have all kinds of names, Jasmine, Jacinta, what again? I'm not against that too. But the reason for names is that you capture the prophecy of that child or you capture the inheritance of that child and you prophesy it over the child. It's not just identity alone. If you give birth to a child and you call the child honor, it's a prophecy. It has gone into his future 25 years later. So his mates will buy cars when they are 40 years. But at 25, he's a millionaire already. I had the story of a young man who they gave him a name in his dialect. They say, world no go agree. That's the meaning of the name. And later in life, everywhere he went to, he was rejected. Then he went somewhere and discovered his name and changed it. And everything began to open up. There's an example like that in the Bible. What of Jabez? First Chronicles chapter 4, 9 to 10. Second, sorry, First Chronicles chapter 2, verse 55, also of Jabez. The Bible says of Jabez in 1 Chronicles 4 verse 9 that Jabez was more honorable than his brethren but his mother called his name Jabez. That statement is not complete, is not, is not correct according to English language because the statement began with his end. Jabez was more honorable than his brothers. That was his later end. But he now went back to his beginning. He said for his mother called him Jabez. So it was supposed to be read as thus that his name was called Jabez because his mother said this but later on he became more honorable name eventually when Jabez dealt with his foundation in 1st Chronicles chapter 2 verse 55 Jabez became so great and he expanded till a city was named after him and the families of the scribes who dwelt at where? Jabez that's why you go pray this night too. are you ready to pray? All right. Let's go back to the lost issue. So Amnon slept with his sister, died. Absalom, his brother, killed him. Absalom took it to another level. He slept with all his father's concubines on the rooftop. So everybody was seeing them. Then Solomon, Solomon now made it an international affair. 700 wives and 300 concubines. He was marrying anyhow. It's as though if Solomon just catches eye contact with a lady, that's a wife already. And the Bible says these women led him to idolatry. There are some people that need to check their problem with lust. You have prayed and fasted, it's not working. Check your foundation. It may be a foundation thing you need to deal with.
And I'm saying this with all the love in my heart. I'm not yet to embarrass us. I came here this night because in my heart it has been bonding, burdened since last Sunday that there are people, if we don't address the issue of foundations, they may never make progress. And I will not join the devil, make you look at God as a liar. And that's why you're hearing the truth. Let me stop here. I have several things I could show you. I would have shown you about Reuben and the course on his life. I would have shown you about Esther and Mordecai. Why Haman rose against them. It was not because he hated them. But the spirit in his lineage was the one fighting them. Because in Esther chapter 3, the Bible says that Haman was of the lineage of a man called Agag. Agag was the king of the Amalekites that God told Saul to destroy and kill. Saul allowed him. When you don't destroy or deal with your enemies today, they will become your children's enemies. Some of you have inherited family battles. Some of you have inherited the enemies or the spirits that fought your fathers, your grandfathers. And now you have to deal with them now so that your children can have a quality life. But there's good news before we pray this night. The Bible says that the yoke shall be destroyed because of what? Thank God that there is liberty in Christ Jesus. Quickly, let me run through how you can access liberty from foundational or from faulty foundations. Number one, you must be born again. Hmm? It's a decision you must make. If any man be in Christ, is a new creature. Let me explain what it means. If any man be in Christ, is a new creature. A creature means he was not a descendant of any other person. A creature means it's the first of its kind. That means that he is not connected to any father or to any mother. So that a cause can tra be transmitted down the bloodline. That's why your redemption in Christ Jesus, God made you a new creature. You are not traceable to any other person. Just the way he created Adam. Adam was the first. You know, Adam was not cursed. I hope you know. You don't know. I'll prove it to you another day. Adam wasn't cursed. And he did not inherit foundation problem. The people that were cursed was Eve and the serpent. I guess that when God looked at Adam and wanted to curse him, he saw his image. Because Adam was created in the image. That is why in Christ Jesus, God did not route you to any human ancestry. Because in Romans 5, 12, where we read, the Bible says, Through one man, sin entered. So if any man be in Christ, is a new creature, a new species. You are not routed to any human ancestry, so that any cause can be permitted. That is why the first thing you will do to break free from foundational issues is you must be born again. And then after that, you take your life in your hands. This deliverance is a project. I must deal with it. You see, there may be somebody now listening to me and just say, well, he has a lot, of, a lot to say from the Bible. But I don't believe in that. I'm born again, therefore it has been settled. But I will plead with you to listen to what I'm saying now. So that you don't keep recycling your pain. Because I would want to ask you, that your belief and your conviction that is against this, that is from the word of God. Where has it taken you to in life? You know the word of God is like a university. When you enter a university, there are different faculties. Every of those faculties teach studies that are related to life issues. No faculty can say they are the most important than any other. Is that true? Every faculty needs one another as far as the studies of life on earth is concerned. That's how the word of God is. The revelation of being a new creature in Christ Jesus and the finished work is good. But that's one faculty in the body of truth. This is another truth we must enter. The second thing you do after being born again is that you must engage the ministry of the word. Study the word of God. Find out what it is written, what is written concerning you. Find out what is written about a new creature in Christ. What did God achieve for you in redemption? What do you know about what God did for you in redemption? Do you know that because of redemption, we have access? 
The Bible says by him we have access to the Father through one spirit. Do you know that true redemption you have forgiveness of sins? Do you know that true redemption you have deliverance? The Bible says let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Whom he has redeemed from the enemy. What do you know? Do you understand the full import of redemption? Not in these days when Christians are in a hurry. To come to church is a problem. They don't even want to be taught about the ways of God from scripture. Everybody is looking for miracle here and there. And I'm wondering, those who have been looking for the miracle from Genesis till today, what has happened in their life? Why don't you experience the greatest deliverance, which is a transformation of your mind? Understand the full import of what God did for you. There is something about the word of God that you know. God does not need to walk again in your life. You can take your life in your own hands. The Bible didn't say that the creature is waiting for the manifestation of children. It's children that are looking for what to receive. The Bible says the creature earnestly awaits the manifestation of who? Sons. I hope I didn't hurt somebody by that. But I'm tired, I'm just I'm tired of this miracle, miracle thing. I believe in the miraculous. I mean, look at all that's been happening in our midst. But I'm just tired of this need driven Christianity. It's a pain and a plague. And of all places in Nigeria, I think the north has to wake up. Because with all due respect, and it's a cry in my heart, the poverty in the north is not only financial, it's also ignorance. Bankruptcy of the knowledge of God. And we don't know that we are the most disadvantaged in all the regions of Nigeria. When I'm talking about northern Nigeria, I'm not talking about only those who are from the north. If you are staying in the north or you were born in the north, you are part of it. And all we do is go around looking for miracles here and there. When the greatest deliverance for a believer is transformation. You know the thing with miracles is, imagine somebody now with this, all this that you have heard and you know you need to deal with foundational issues and the person is wanting a pastor, let me use that word, he wants a pastor to just do like this. Lay his hands and then it is over. How to pray, we don't know how to do anything to involve or engage God. Eventually, even if that works, I hope you know that if you were that individual, you will not understand the secrets in the kingdom that made for that deliverance. And because of that, you are, the, Satan will take advantage of your ignorance and he will come back many years later with the same captivity. And you'll be stranded because when they were solving the class work, you were, you were typing text message. You were whatsapping. So today now is exam and they brought the same question. You don't know how to solve it. I hope you understand what I'm saying. Sit down and go into the word of God. Let God show you how do I deal with this. And it's nothing more than knowing who God has made you to be in Christ Jesus. And then enforcing that reality. Number three. Engage the place of prayer and fasting. Matthew 17, 21. This kind goeth not except by prayer and fasting. Isaiah 58, verse 6. Is this not the fast that I've commanded? That you loosen the heavy burdens. That you let the oppressed go free. That you lose the band of wickedness. You undo the heavy burdens. And that you break every yoke. Prayer and fasting is the law enforcement agency of the spirit. What God has written about you has been written. But it doesn't mean it will manifest. It takes a law enforcement agency like prayer to insist that it come to pass. I hope you know that Satan is an illegal spirit. In his ways, he's illegal. He knows that God has said it and it is written concerning you. But to hell with you, it is written. He will keep denying you on it until you enforce and insist in the place of prayer. That was why every time men prayed in scripture, they got results. Those results were the promise of God for them. In the case of Isaac, in Genesis 25, in verse 21, the Bible says, Isaac prayed hard. Message translation. Brothers, put your prayer life on fire because marriage is a good testing ground. I, the husbands, I hope I'm saying the truth. Husbands, am I lying? Okay. Better be on fire now. Stop eating chocolate and pursuing girls. Instead of pursuing three girlfriends, chase one. Use the remaining time that you use for the two. 
Know God. Understand the spirit realm. Know how to route yourself from any problem. Because there is a test in future. And there is a time when Papa's number will be off. And I say it with love. It's the truth. Most of these things I'm teaching you, I discovered it on my own. Of course, listen to some. But I sat down to do this research. Not just as a pastor, but as a man. If I fail in ministry, at least let me not fail in a family. I know where I'm coming from. I know the things I suffered. And I must ensure that I finish the battles so that my children can have it. I told somebody, I say, when my first son, if you tell my first son that I was once poor, he will swear with his life that is not true. It won't happen by just talk. You will have to engage those forces. And then finally, trust the leading of the Spirit to guide you. As you pray and fast, trust the Holy Spirit to guide you. Sometimes in those seasons of travail and prayer, He will give you an instruction. You know, the Bible says, For this cause, many are weak, many are sick. And many sleep. He said because they do not discern the body. In the body of Christ there are several graces. That thing you are praying for is a possibility in, in another person's life. But as you pray and seek the face of God, the Holy Ghost can direct you. Go to so-so person, sow a seed. Or go to so-so person, let them pray for you. Sometimes in your dream you can even see God will use the face of somebody and come to you. And you wake up from that dream and your life enters a new chapter. It is when you engage the leading of the spirit that you can access the prophetic which is now the yoke breaker. Are you ready to pray? Stand on your feet. Well, you don't need me to give you a prayer point. You can just start talking to God with all that you have heard. Just talk to God in two minutes. You've heard so much tonight. Let God arise. Let his enemies be scattered. This is that day and time where God wants to bring an end to captivity. Tonight is the night where God wants to visit your foundations. Can you thank him for what you have heard tonight? <laughs> 